There's nothing new under the sun. It happened before and it will happen again. But that is not a fatalistic position, rather one of optimism and expectancy. You see, there was once a restriction to enter the holiest of holy places. There was also a way in. What was it in that most holy place? In the natural, it was called the Ark of the Testimony. And what acted as a great barrier, a massive veil, a 15 foot high, 15 foot wide, four inch thick curtain. And at the time of Christ, the curtain was twice as large. What was sealed behind that veil? Man's deepest connection with God. Yes, what was hidden behind the curtain was just waiting to be revealed, was his testimony, which was ultimately symbolic of your testimony. Consider this a portrayal of your heart toward God, or your potential intimacy with Yahweh. There was a thick veil between you and deep, authentic connection with your Creator. In hard terms, we might even call it a heart, heart or scar tissue. For entry behind the veil to access the full testimony and every blessing and promise from Yahweh, that veil must be torn. Much like the scar tissue needs to be broken to reveal the soft, renewed tissue below, your heart must be rent in an act of circumcision to uncover the soft and pliable home in which God can dwell. Once your heart beats with the life of God, your testimony will be available for all to see. Moses erected a veil to separate the testimony from the people. Yeshua dismantled that veil to expose the light of the hidden within. Your privilege is to enter beyond the veil with Christ and to let the light of your heart shine before man as a testimony that glorifies God. What not to do, don't stitch the torn veil. Don't seal off the testimony. Don't cover up what God has done. Don't return to your old ways. Don't hide your light under a basket. Not for the reading of God's holy writ. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there, behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. That is Exodus chapter 26, verse 33. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Leviticus 16, verse 2. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, that is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Matthew chapter 27, verse 15 and 20 and 51. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, the veil that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 22. Join in prayer. Father, we want to slow down our hurried pace of life. We want to come, bow our heads in your sovereign presence, ask you to indwell each and every one of us ask you to open up your scriptures in ways where indeed we might have never really recognized and that as we hear human voices speaking these words today Lord ultimately it is your character your ways yourself that is being revealed unto each and every one and that as we take those scriptures, allow them to do what they're designed to do, that they, they will bring, bring forth everlasting change, everlasting impact for your kingdom. And we desire, Lord, to indeed walk worthy of the calling that you have placed upon us. So, Lord, I pray for this congregation here and now. Their hearts are receptive and ready 
to uh, receive what you have decided to speak today and that your spirit once again will descend upon each and every one in Yeshua's name we pray Amen Welcome yet again to another Friday evening at Kingdom Embassy Ministries and as I normally do I'd like to once again introduce that lovely beautiful website that we have put together KingdomEmbassyMinistries.org if you have not yet visited it, please do so. Uh, click on all the resources that are there. Spend time understanding what this ministry is all about. And normally, I've been making a habit of um, walking along my weeks and just kind of taking spiritual inventory as to what's happening um, and what things are taking place. And this week was kind of an interesting let's say spiritual and the natural uh, connection. I, I found myself having to defend a very, very close friend of mine to uh, someone who was being called out for certain behaviors. Um, and, the, and the subject matter and the conversation was kind of uh, pinnacled today with another conversation with another brother, which had to do with, can the devil really make you do something that you don't want to do? And you know, as Dr. Said, Jeff said earlier, uh, prior to the introduction today, that the moment you hear certain things, after you read the word for so many years, I was telling uh, one of my workers today that I've been reading the Bible now for almost 19 years in a row, without fail, every single day. And it doesn't come at a moment of time when I don't read that Bible, and I don't come across something that either challenges a thought or something new in a revelation of that. And so, as, I, as I'm sitting there talking to this close friend of mine this morning and the one earlier in the week, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is a verse that I think each, each and every one of us as a congregation should probably kind of take on and, and, and uh, try to memorize it. And I haven't visited for a while, but I, I know more or less the gist of it, uh, which I think it says, no temptation has, uh, has uh, overtaken you, except such as is coming to man but God is faithful who will not allow you to bear it. And uh, with that temptation, he also will provide the way out. And so immediately it came to mind to, to say that to, to uh, the, the gentleman in the early part of the week. But the, the verse that came to mind this morning in regards to the situation he was dealing with and were asking me if the devil can make you do something or say something that you don't want to say is, is James chapter 1. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's a loud airplane flying by, right? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, I kind of made a joke about it, and you've heard this before. It's nothing new. It's not mine. It's not mine. But the fact that we have two ears on one, one mouth is not just for aesthetic purposes. And God wants you to do twice the listening and only have the speaking. And so if you, if you take some, some connecting dots, if you're indwelled by the Spirit of God, the devil cannot make you do anything. Now he can put people in front of you and circumstances in front of you that may challenge your self-control. And that's where the rubber meets the road. But the fact of the matter is that you're challenged in your self-control area, then you may find yourself doing things that you should not be doing as a believer. But don't blame the devil for it. Because I think we spend a lot of time giving him more power than he really has. If we're indwelled by the, by the resurrected Christ, by the Spirit of God, then we should be able to do exactly what the Bible says. And with that temptation that's being presented in front of you, you should be able to bear it. And as you think about the circumstance of whatever it is you may be facing, whether it be somebody challenging you or something and trying to get, you, the, get, get your, lack of a better statement, your goat going, don't fall into the trap. That's all it is. It's really only a trap. And so I don't know who that speaks to here. I know that as I was talking to the people that I was talking to in regards to the circumstances, I know that it was something that was a reminder to me in my very own walk, in my very own life, for many different reasons, to always do exactly what James says. Be swift to hear. There's a reason why, we do, why we're supposed to do that. If you can ascertain the reason why somebody's saying something or you're in the middle of a circumstance, you'll have the opportunity to speak 
in a lot better way about it to that other individual, which you can actually continue to, to help, uh, hang on to your self-control. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks, man. Yes, yes, welcome back to KM, my, uh, my favorite night of the week. And um, so we are, as we continue uh, careening towards the end of Exodus, we find ourselves in Exodus 25, all the way through 27, 19. It's an area of scripture where most Christians want to, if you don't speed read, this is where you speed read. It's like, I don't care about curtains and thread and colored this and poles and all the hammering and I mean the details, details, details. It's like who needs to know this stuff, right? So first today we're going to going to stop and realize that we can't bypass this without recognizing prophetic patterns. That's the most first thing we're going to touch on today. Number two we're going to really hone in on the imagery of the veil. Did you notice in the introduction, Manny described that veil 15 foot wide, 15 foot high. This is in the tabernacle. Four inches thick, like a, like a phone book, uh, this generation. You don't know what a phone book is, right? What's a phone book? What's a phone book? Um, that veil separated the, the holy place from the holiest of holy places, right? The most holy place. We'll learn how we gained uninhibited access to that most holy place. Now I know you all know that as Christians right off the bat. Like, oh yeah, I know how that happened. But we're going to really hone in on the details of that. And prayerfully, we will move beyond the basic understanding of our freedom to enter behind the veil, to come into a full appreciation of what we've been granted and what we are called to do with that privilege. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's, let's start off uh, I would think in all these uh, these months and, and a few years that have passed, this might be the most the shortest introductory section. I mean, it's really short, right? It's called "Nothing New Under the Sun," and and, and I found you know I, I kind of like access the verse. You know, guys, you know we we do church outside, right? Right near an executive airport. So, like I said, verses come to my mind when I read the scripture. So as I read through Exodus 25 and 26 and into 27, four times Moses writes something very similar. You know, if you're paying attention, you'll say in Exodus 25, 9, he says, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Um, handful of verses later in 2540 it says and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which I've shown you on the mountain in 2630 it says and she shall raise up the tabernacle according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain you guys see you guys seeing a pattern and 27 8 you shall make it hollows with boards as it was shown you on the mountain and I thought to myself I kind of thought to myself, you know, that sounds like there's nothing new under the sun, right? Just make it as you make the pattern, you know, like on the mountain. And, and I went to that verse, you know, the famous verse in Ecclesiastes 1, when it says, listen, listen to how relevant. That's what, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. You can see it? And there is nothing new under the sun. One more. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. Is there anything, see, this is new. <clears throat> it has already been in ancient times before us. You see, that's the picture that Moses is leaving us. Four times in those short two chapters, two and a half chapters, do it exactly like the pattern. Now, the real secret, by the way, if you want to know the, the greatest revelation of the Old Testament, you know, um, one of the greatest revelations, you're going to find it in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 8, in the first six verses, it says, this is the main point, which usually means in all languages that this is the main point. 
<laughs> so you should probably pay attention to what he's about to say. We have a high priest. This high priest, we know who he is, right, as believers. He's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Fast forward. It is necessary then, according to the law, who serves as a copy or shadow of heavenly things, and here it is, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown on the mountain. So we see this amazing, hey, listen, that thing that happened back there, that thing that was going to happen later, see, that's not a new thing. That's a thing from ancient times. And then, of course, it goes on to say he's a mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. I taught about this verse. It's like, oh, yeah, that's how you can get rid of that old covenant because Yeshua is a mediator of the new covenant established on better promises until you do a teeny bit of research and you look up the word established in Greek and it's nomotheteo, established on the law. That's what it means. That means the new covenant is established on the law. Why? Because the whole thing is established on a pattern. If you get rid of the patterns, you've got nothing to establish it on, right? I mean, you've heard this before. It's like installing an app on your phone and then removing the operating system or on a computer. It's like you can't remove the operating system. You know, Yeshua is the app on the operating system. The law is the operating system. So that's where we start. It's patterns. Now, we could go through every detail in these chapters and talk about all these things, but the, ring, the thing that really caught my attention, that really grabbed me, was the veil. And that should grab you. That four inch thick veil that you, know, you couldn't hardly lift. How could you lift this thing? 15 foot wide. By the way, depending on what you, you're reading, some say it was 60 feet by 30 in the tabernacle. Some say 30 by 30. Four inches thick at the time that Jesus was alive. It says in Exodus 26, make a veil. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in behind the veil. And here it is. The veil shall be a divider. There it is. A divider between the holy place and the most holy place. You see, now, if you're willing to not just read past that in speed reading, but say, if that's a pattern, which we know as believers, fast forward all the way to Hebrews chapter eight, there's a reason why that pattern was on the mountain because Yeshua is the mediator of that actual covenant. And if there's a veil that's supposed to separate holy things from the most holy things, we better pay attention because there's really nothing new under the sun. See, that's why it should catch your attention. And so what we notice in the Leviticus verse that Manny read in the introduction, in Leviticus 16, you see what happens. It says, it says access behind that veil is limited to one man, the high priest, one time per year. By the way, you try to get back, you try to get access where you shouldn't be, you die. So it's not like you have a gold rush to get behind the veil back then. Like who wants to get behind the veil when you're going to wind up dead when you're not supposed to be there. So we know that. And then we see, if we fast forward back again to Hebrews, we see, you see, all covenants have conditions. The first one had specific stipulations about who can enter. The, the holiest of holy, it contains, that, that contains the testimony of God. You should lock that into your memory. It's really the inner chambers with the Lord. It's like the testimony of God Kind of think about it. the testimony of God is sitting behind that veil, but you have limited access. You see, it says in Hebrews, he could only go behind the second part once per year into the holiest of all, one time per year. That would really stink. Can you imagine if you were trying to access an intimate connection with God? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's good, but you got to pick a date, just one date. As a matter of fact, you can't even do it because only really one person that can do it, and that stinks. That's not the life you want, right? So, of course, the, the, uh, the first covenant uh, allowed entry once, but in the second covenant, it made access continuously. It says this in uh, Hebrews 9, 6, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, 
while the first tabernacle had a standing, it was symbolic for the present time, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience. Meaning that old thing that existed, that old system of one man goes behind the veil once per year, you see, that was, that, that was a pattern, nothing new under the sun, but it couldn't finish the task. It couldn't, it couldn't make the person perfect and it wasn't even accessible in its fullness at the present time that Hebrews was written, which ironically is like 25 or 30 years after the resurrection. It's a very important thing to consider about what's, what's going on. And then it says, until the time of reformation, which I believe in the times we live in today, or restoration, is what's coming to the earth, meaning we have certain access, which we're going to talk about. But, but before we get to what it says about that and how it happened, examine yourself this way. If you think you have complete, unlimited access as a Christian, right? Because you know that, you think that, you believe that, then tell me about... Um, that it couldn't make one who performed the service perfect regarding their conscience. Just examine yourself. Is your conscience perfect? Are you like crystal clear, pure all the time? Clear mind, no sin in the mind? Okay, so that first thing, that shadow of the priest going back once per year, that couldn't do it. But here you are 2,000 years after this happened. Ready? Uh, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil, the four-inch thick veil, back then maybe 30 feet wide, 30 feet tall, was torn from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks split. You want to find the deeper meaning. That doesn't make a lot of sense in itself. Like if you just read that, if you were just new to the Bible, you said, oh, the veil was torn in the temple. What does that even mean to you? You don't know what the temple is. You don't know what the veil is. But let's say you're reading the Bible. Okay, I know the veil, that's, that's an Exodus thing. And, 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 and the priest going behind the veil, that's a Leviticus thing. And, and Jesus cut the veil. What does that even mean? Let's go back to Hebrews. This hope we have is an anchor of our soul, both sure and steadfast, let's call that Yeshua, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So you see, that veil was torn because Yeshua has taken the role of the high priest forever to go behind the veil, not to perform service like the high priest did back then, but to make access for you to go behind the veil. Man, that's, that's deep, right? This is what it says in, in Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the whole... Now he's talking to you. Having boldness to enter by the blood of Jesus, Yeshua, by the new and living way which he consecrated for us. Here's the secret. Here's the secret of that Matthew verse. Consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a heart and full assure, a full assurance and faith, have our, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Wow. So here's the picture. Moses is making this tabernacle. He's making this veil. He's making every detail. You get it? According to the pattern on the mountain. Don't stray from one detail. We find out later it's important because it's a heavenly shadow. The priesthood and the tabernacle, all the utensils, every stitch and every fiber, every badger skin, the size, the weight, the distance, all of it. A perfect pattern of something heavenly. And yet, we see this conscience. Somehow we have to get behind that veil 
and stand there with a clear conscience. Okay, so we can do that sometimes. You guys have entered the presence of the Lord, entered the holy place, you've been in your prayer, and you're feeling this clean thing, and then, and then you do it like every Christian does. You, you walk back out, you zip up the curtain, forget it's there, and go on like nothing happened. Right back to the, you know, the sour conscience. So, what I want to offer you today is like, you know, because I'm a physician, right, by trade, right? So it's like diagnosis, surgery, prognosis. That's what we want to talk about, right? And so, can we all agree, clearly, as believers, there's no doubt the torn veil at the cross, his broken body, Hebrews gives us the details, right? You may, most Christians, you know, you don't want to read about any of this stuff in, in in, in Exodus, like bypass those chapters, fast forward, priesthood, sac- tabernacle, fast forward. I like the 10 plagues and the whole thing makes good movies, but you're not going to get any movies about this tabernacle thing. That's boring, right? Fast forward. How about Hebrews? How many of you can't wait to get into Hebrews when you're home, right? It's like, I don't understand that. I don't know what he's talking about there. I don't know what that imagery means. That's crazy. I don't know if that's past, it's present, it's future. It's written for some kind of scholar. But there's no way you can understand the details of what Jesus did on the cross unless you're looking at these words in Hebrews. That's his, that's his body that was broken. His flesh was the veil. And it made the way. So let's start off with diagnosis, right? Diagnosis, prayer. Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. That's an honest prayer, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Honest assessment. What's going on in here? Search me. Search my heart, right? You know, Yeshua, he talked about that heart, right? In Luke's gospel. Good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, for every tree is known by its fruit. A good man, here's the fruit out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. What an amazing introduction, man. He's talking about, I know I know how to keep myself from 90% of my sin. Just don't say anything, right? <laughs> Just stop talking, right? Especially stop talking too much, right? So, so we have a diagnosis. Search me, God. What are we searching? Search the inner chambers of my heart. Those inner chambers of my heart, they might be likened to the inner chamber of that, that Holy of Holies. They might be. The barrier to that heart might be that veil. It might be that, that thick curtain that's in the way. Uh, of course, you know, can't do a sermon without some Roman scriptures, right? So let's, let's look at what it says about, about how you're operating. For as many have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. As many have sinned with the law will be judged by the law. It's not the hearers of the law that will be justified, but the doers of the law will be justified. That's a a verse that no Christians want to ever preach about. The doers of the law will be justified. I thought Jesus did it all for me. I don't know. I like that verse at all. That's terrible. What does doers of the law mean? You know, this is not for tonight's teaching, but it's very simple. Obeying God with faith because your heart's been changed. That's doing the law. Obeying God with faith because your heart's been changed. That's doing the law. He goes on to say, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves. In other words, they show the law, the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. There's that conscious thing again. See, it's like, it's not whether or not you could recite the Torah or you've read you know, Genesis to Deuteronomy 20 times or you know every detail, 613 commandments. It's not that. I mean, that's important. But when you're obeying God with a clear conscience because you're hearing from the Lord, and by the way, the Lord will never direct you to do something contrary to the laws of God. If you think that's the case, that's called self-deception, right? If you feel good about disobeying God because you think you're not disobeying God, because you think it's okay to do something against the laws of God, you just happen to be wrong. Okay? 
It goes on to say this. Now we also know, by the way, that's Romans 2, 12 to 16. In Romans 3, one chapter later, remember what he just said? The doers of the law shall be justified. That's the takeaway. The doers of the law shall be justified. But he says something that seems altogether different one chapter later. He says, we know that whatever the law said, it says to those that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped up and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in the sight of God. So by, by, by deeds of the law, you can't be justified, but by doing the law, you, shall, you can be justified, which makes you logically conclude that doing the law and deeds of law aren't the same thing. Deeds of the law in modern, modern terminology is called legalism. I do a checklist of things to obey God because they're on a list and I think that makes me righteous, but I don't really care about those things. I don't really care about God. I just do them, check, 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 check. As far as God's concerned, that accounts for nothing. Right? It's not by faith, it's not with a true heart, right? So, so what do you do? You know what it says in Jeremiah? It says, it says I mean, in, in Deuteronomy, as we talk about the surgery, this is how you get to the place. This is how you go from deeds of law to doers of law. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Jeremiah says this. We'll touch this in a few places. It says this. Break up the fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart. There's the imagery. Circumcised heart. Take away the foreskin of your heart. And then we have the instrument used. Like what would a surgeon do? What kind of, what kind of instrument does a surgeon use to do surgery a scalpel here's the scalpel ready for the word of god is powerful sharper than a two-edged sword piercing even the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrows and a discerner and the thoughts and tents of the heart. there it is the heart there's no creature hidden from his sight but all things are laid naked and open to, to the eyes of him whom they must give account see it's the the word of god is acting as this scalpel it's supposed to cut away the foreskin, cut away the scar tissue of a hard heart to yield this like supple, soft, renewed tissue, right? Let's say that happens. What's the prognosis? I'm gonna get the surgery. I got a diagnosis, I'm gonna get the surgery. Everybody wants to know like, what's the potential outcome here? You're not gonna go get under the scalpel if you can't be assured of some, some good outcome, right? Go back to Deuteronomy, just a verse later. We were in verse 6, now we're in verse 8, Deuteronomy 30. And it says, And you will again, here's the, you will again obey the voice of the Lord to do his commandments. See, there it is. There's the prognosis. I got my heart circumcised. Outcome, do the commandments. Paul, doers of the law will be justified. Moses, do the commandments. That's what's going to happen with a circumcised heart, mm -hmm. right? Let's go back. Let's go back to Romans again and read it. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. He really talks about circumcision. What do you think he's talking about here? He's not inventing a new concept. He says, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. You see it? Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Da, 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 da. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart and the spirit. Romans 2, 25 to 29. Fast forward to chapter 3. Where's the boasting then? It's excluded by what, what law? Law of works? No! By the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified apart from the deeds of the law. There it is again. God who will, will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. See, it's all about faith. That's how the circumcision works. So we can just go ahead and get rid of the law, right? No, the next verse. Do we then make the law through faith, the law void through faith? 
Certainly not. On the, on, on the contrary, we establish law. You see, it's always just been a pattern. The law back then, circumcision did this, it meant this. It was a pattern, really like a pattern on the mountain. Our job is to fulfill the pattern on the mountain. There's nothing new under the sun. Don't try to change it. By the way, get rid of the instruction, get rid of the pattern. You got nothing to stand on, right? So what's the post-surgery outcome? This is something that God showed me many years ago when I was writing, um, writing a book called The Heart of David. This is all the way back in like 2004. And I caught this, this nuance studying through these, this area back in Exodus 25. This was what God's promised. It sounds great, right? Yahweh will dwell among and walk among them. I'm going to make my sanctuary and I will dwell among them and walk among them. See, that was the promise. That sounds awesome. This sanctuary, what sanctuary? This thing that Moses is building. If you build this thing, I'll dwell among the people and walk among them. It says it again later in the next portion that we come up on, Exodus 29. It's going to say, I will dwell among the children of Israel. In Leviticus, I will walk among you and I will be your God. See, there's that beautiful thing. God's among us. Don't you want that? Like they're going to build this tabernacle and the promise is if you do this thing, build everything according to the pattern on the mountain, God is going to walk among you. That sounds fabulous. Paul saw something completely different. That was a pattern. Walking among you was a pattern. It was the, it was the shadow. The true 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Whoa. Your tabernacle? You're the temple of the living God? Wasn't he just a... Listen to this. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. That's different. That pattern back there, he was going to dwell in. That whole tabernacle, you're the, te you're, the te you're the temple. He's going to come and be in that holy of holies, that inner sanctuary, those chambers. What's the one organ in the human body that has chambers? The heart. The heart. I'm going to dwell in the inner chamber. We're going to call that the testimony. The ark of the testimony is in there. So, how are, you the, how are you the temple, right? Let's just do a little Hebrew 6. For Christ as the son over his own house, whose house you are. There you are, you're a house. For we are God's fellow workers, God's field. You are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Do you not know that you're the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Or do you not know that, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in, me, who is in you? whom you have from God and you're not your own because you were bought with a price. Stop living like you're your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You know, and the most, you know, famous ministry verse in Christianity, Ephesians 4, he gave some to the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And here's the architectural term. You'll miss it if you don't, if you don't catch it. For the edifying of the body till we all come to a unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the fullness of stature of Christ, that we may all grow up into the head, who is him. Edify, edifice, building. You grow up into the building of God. You grow up into the temple of God, where your inner chambers, your inner chambers are circumcised, the, 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 the veil is torn, the Spirit has entered the chambers, and you don't do what, what mankind just keeps doing. Now, let me step outside. You know, I got, this is nice. Let me step outside, sew up those, that torn curtain. That's a different place. Again, Yeshua, 20, uh, Matthew 27, 50 and 51, his body was torn when that veil and that veil was torn at the same time. His body was broken, and that veil was torn at the same time. You know, when Paul recounts the, the, um, 
what took place at the Last Supper, you know, the night he was betrayed, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, this is what Yeshua said, take and eat, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Broken, yeah, torn. Like that flesh is the veil, right? For it was fitting for him, back to Hebrews, for whom all things and by whom all things are, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. See, something has to happen to get behind that veil. I, we, we love the free Christianity. Jesus died for me. I'm like, but we hate the suffering. It says in Philippians 2, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Back to Hebrews 5, it says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up many prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. What is that describing? That's the garden of Gethsemane. And she was like, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to do it. One person can get me out of this. Father, get me out of this. And the father's like, no, there's only one person to get you out of this. That's you. All you got to say is, I don't want to do it. And Yeshua said, no, I'll do it. Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became author, and etern uh, author of the eternal salvation. <laughs> so here we are as believers today. 2,000 years after these events, we're sitting here. We know the veil's torn. We have access behind the curtain. Inside that curtain is the testimony of God, right? Isn't that where you're carrying the testimony of God in your life? Isn't it in the chambers of your heart? You know, in first, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, it says this. Um, it even alludes to the fact that he not only tore that curtain, he, he, he got rid of the whole thing. He like wants to make access so clear that he took it out of the way. There remains, their minds were blinded for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted over the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now, of course, this is talking about the veil that Moses put over his face, but catch the imagery. Because the veil is taken away in Christ, but even to this day when Moses is read, a veil remains on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, it's taken out of the way. See, so that's what you have access to. So now that it's gone, you know, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, right? By his stripes we are healed. You know, that verse, classically, Isaiah 53, right? Classic Isaiah. That's the messianic prophecy of Isaiah. We love by his stripes we are healed. We use that verse when somebody's sick, when somebody's dying, when somebody's injured, you know, he, you know, he, he took the, the beating on the cross and the whips and the stripes, you know, those stripes, those road marks on his back, and we're healed. It's so much more than that. It's by his stripes you have entry behind the veil. Could there be anything more healing than entry behind the veil? Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, here we are again, the new and living way, which he consecrated us through the veil, which is his flesh. Having your heart sprinkled, again, Hebrews 10. Seeing then that we have such a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast the confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Let us go boldly before the testimony of God and sit right there. Another way of saying that is let the testimony of God come and dwell inside the chambers of your heart. Boldly. You know, or do you, or do you, or do you not care that much about that work? Like, 
There's no theologian in all of Christianity that wouldn't say, hey, as a Christian, you have free access behind the veil. I, I'm agreeing with that. I, I'm just saying the problem is you keep zipping up that veil and walking out. Why? Why? You know why. <laughs> Jesus told us why. Yeshua said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on, all, uh, on earth. Right? Why? They're useless. They're worthless. They get rusty and moths eat them and they decay. Instead, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You see, the problem is, in order for you to stay behind the curtain, you have to leave your heart behind the curtain. And you want to come out because you want to go after the treasures that are on the other side of the curtain. That's what's going on. But he also said, you can't serve two masters. He said it like this. Do not worry about those things of the world. All those things of the world. Gentiles worry about those things. Non-believers are concerned with those things. You don't have to worry about those things. Instead, famous verse, seek the kingdom. And all those things get taken care of. That's like, I could just... Go, I could just go camp behind the veil. I could stay there. My heart can dwell there. It can stay there. I don't have to worry about the stuff on the other side. I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. <laughs> can you imagine? We're going to make our way as we turn towards the close, all the way back to Exodus again, right in the beginning, maybe this, I think the second verse of our portion. There's a diagnostic tool. He throws it right in before he even gives us any of these this details. This is what it says. Speak to the children of Israel. You want to know, you want to really examine what's going on in here. What makes you keep jumping outside the veil and going on the outside? It's very simple. Moses said it like this. Speak to the children of Israel. This is God. That, that they may bring to me an offering for everyone who gives willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. There it is. What, what does that mean? It's like, what are you going to do with your treasures? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your life? Are you so concerned about what's on the wrong side of the veil? You're spending all of your energy and all of your time there. And you peek in behind that veil. It's so glorious. You can taste it. You can feel it. You, you might cry. You have this experience. But, but, you, but you're not willing to stay there because your treasure is somewhere else. 2 Corinthians 9 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. You see, there it is. God can care less about your stuff. He doesn't need your stuff. He needs your heart. He needs your heart. He needs you to come behind that veil and stay there. That's where all abundance is. All sufficiency lies. That's everything. The stuff on the other side is just going to burn away. It's a moth-eaten, rusty mess. Oops. Now you will never, never read, you will never read the parable of the soils again the same way. Let's, let's aim towards the close by exploring the parable of the soils. You know it. It's, it's um, <laughs> think of it this way. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. See, that's what this whole thing's about. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. You know, so he, he and let's say this. It's the parable of competing desires of the heart. That's how you should see it. It's the parable of competing desires. You know, stop reading the Bible like it's some cool story. It's like, oh yeah, look at that cool story. Jesus told a parable. Like, you should read this and say, man, that's me. Or that's me. Like, which one are you? Okay, so which one are you? Ready? So he spoke to many things, parables. Behold, the sower went out and he sowed. And he sowed some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell by stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they, they were scorched because they had no root. So they withered away. And some, ooh, doesn't this sound familiar? Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground. So you got four soils, 
that good ground yielded a crop, 60, 100, 160, some 30 fold. If you have ears to hear, let them hear. Here you are, you know? Do you wanna, do you wanna go and hear this? Because it has been given to you. So, so he says, hold on, he goes on to say, if you have ears to hear, pay attention to this, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So this entire message around the hearts, the competing commitments of your heart, is a, is a kingdom mystery. Yeah, you know what the mystery is? Um, I, I want to stay on this side of the veil because I care more about those things. Or can you access with a willing heart what's behind the veil, the testimony of God, and stay there, fixed in that place. And I, there's nothing, nothing more valuable. You will never find something more precious, more satisfying, more, more confidence building, more valuable than staying behind that veil. Why? Forever has. To him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has is going to be taken away. You see, if you stay on the wrong side of the veil, you can't keep anything anyway. <laughs> Who doesn't understand this? For the hearts of the people have grown dull, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn. What? Lest they actually have the surgery, that's the circumcision surgery, and then stay behind the veil. So I should heal them. What kind of healing? Not, not your disease, your heart, your heart. Lord, please explain the parable to us as he continues. Uh, well, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and it doesn't understand it, the wicked one snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one who was thrown by the wayside. There's one. But whoever's received on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a little while. Little trial, tribulation comes, persecution arises. He stumbles. He's done. Now, he received the seed, the seed among thorns. Yeah, this, by the way, those first two, those two Christians don't struggle with that one. This is the one right here. This is the Christian dilemma. The third soil. Among thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. That's it right there. See, for where the treasure of your heart is where the treasure is, so will your heart be. That's what happens. It's like, I could, I could spend a little time behind the veil, but it's so much better. And by the way, you can't just go back out of the veil and into the world. You don't want to leave it rent. If you leave it rent, the light will be coming out. That's, let's zip it up, sew it up, close it up, block it off. Because you want the deceitful riches of the world. That's like, God planted you and, and you grew up among thorns and thistles and got choked off. <laughs> of course, the good ground is here. hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit, as we know. Now, do you know where Yeshua got that third soil from? I read it to you already. He didn't make it up. It was right out of Jeremiah chapter 4. Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the forced thing of your hearts. See, he's telling us, he's like, by the way, that's kind of a level. You got to get past that stop, the circumcision of the heart, right there. That's how you get past the deceitfulness of riches, not just money, right? The world. Everything the world wants to offer you that tempts you to slip back behind the veil. What's behind the veil? You want to know how attractive it is? It's like, it's the testimony of God. We have the divider between mankind and the testimony of God. That's what it says in Exodus 26. And, and of course, in Matthew 27, again, he tore the veil. Uh, he made a way with his presence behind the veil as a forerunner, Hebrews 6. He tells us to draw near with a heart of assurance through the veil. In Hebrews 10, we heard all these already. Then we see what it looks like. You know what it looks like permanently behind that veil? Do you know there's a picture of this in the, in the New Testament? you have any idea? Here's what it says. The New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. 
And John, the revelator, says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need for a sun or a moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated, and the Lamb was its light. That's what's sitting behind the Holy of Holies. The full revelation and light of God is sitting. It's so bright, you don't need stars and suns anymore. The whole universe is lit with the light. Do you know that's what you have access to? That's what you're leaving behind because you won't stay there because you're out chasing something, anything. In Matthew 5, Yeshua said, you are the light of the world. How, how can you even possibly fulfill this if you won't even stay in long enough to get some light on? A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. See, is that what you're doing? But on a lampstand, and he gives it light to all who are in the house, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works, and it ain't about you. So you can glorify, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. That's what John the Baptist said. I will decrease, so he will increase. This is not about your light shining. This is his light shining in you, so he's glorified. But what are you, just a dull little flicker? Like a four watt bulb? Because you won't stay behind the veil? I love how Paul words it. How shall he who died to sin live in it any longer? How can you go over there and come back here? How can you do it? <laughs> Peter, it's not nearly as gracious. You know, Peter's a rough guy, right? He says it this way. For if after you've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end's worse than the beginning. For it would have better, been better for them to not have even known. But it happened. You know what that is? If you keep going here and going here and going here and going here, uh, it's like a dog returning to his vomit. That's what Peter calls it. Or a pig going back after they took a bath into a pile of mud. That's the, pic that's the picture. I'll leave you with a few prophetic words from the book of Hosea. Like, maybe an admonition. I don't know why Christians would need this, right? You would think, you'd think you would get this already. Come and let us return to the Lord. <laughs> For he has torn us and he will heal us. Heal us, right? Isn't that it? Like, when will your heart be torn, circumcised, <coughs> the hard, crusty scabs over it removed, and the soft, pliable flesh, the, the chambers, receiving the, the testimony of God? <laughs> he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth will be established in the morning. Yeah, when the sun is shining, when the light is shining. That's what we're called to do. I hope as we kind of leave today, right, go off back into our daily lives, like this something happened to you today that you said, listen, I'm not, I'm not cashing it in again. I'm not going to leave here and just run back to all of the concerns of my life and forget what's behind that veil. I'm telling you, I promise you, if you will, if you will take the time, if you will like, Invest your free time. I tell this to people I'm working with all the time. And you got 168 hours in the week. How much of it is God's? A token 15 minutes in the morning, maybe while you're half asleep. Maybe we should get to the point where we spend more time with God than we sleep. You'll taste so much goodness behind that veil, you'll never want to come out. So what do we do today? Tell me you recognize prophetic patterns today. Uh, you could not miss it, right? That was point number one. The imagery of the veil and the tabernacle and the separation, got a good, you, you got that? Got making sense to you? We learned how we had gained uninhibited access, point three. And hopefully we did this. We moved beyond the basics of our freedom to enter behind the veil and gained a full appreciation of what we've been granted and what we're called to do with that privilege. If nothing, I hope I left you with that as we go forward as a mature 
people of God. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you. We praise you for your word. We, are, we promise, you promise us that your word will not go out and return void. So let your word do its work in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. Amen.